Hi, and welcome to Maine Challenge. I am so excited and honored to have with us today two incredible leaders um, from Inside Out, a movement that works with young people who are in course incarcerated and formerly incarcerated in arts and theater. And we're really gonna talk about criminal justice reform. We're gonna talk about what goes on. And I could not have two better guests. I am very honored to know them both. Bruce King is the co-executive director of Maine Inside Out. And Joseph Jackson is the director of leadership development at Maine Inside Out. They both have incredible backgrounds. Um, Joseph is a poet. He is a, he works, uh, has got his master's degree all, all from USM. He's been in the who's who. There's a million I can do for both of you. You have quite, both of you have the incredible rap sheets of all the amazing, uh, incredible things that you have done. Um, and Bruce has, you know, been doing leadership development. He does a lot of uh, public service stuff. He's on the Permanent Commission for Racial and Indigenous Equity. Um, so everyone recognizes your leadership and how it, uh, what amazing people you are. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being on Main Challenge. It's an honor to have you both here. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Bruce, help us understand first about what Inside Out does, what you're working on, um, and you, how long you've been around. Tell us a little bit about, I, I was fortunate enough to see Inside Out come and do a theater performance at the State House a couple of years ago. And everybody, I mean, the uh, young people just blew everyone away. So tell us a little bit about the mission and where you are. Sure. Um, so it, it's, it's really, it's hard to tell it without a, a short story, um, okay. you know. You know, we started um, with uh, three co-founders, Tessie, Kiara, and Margo, taking in uh, theater workshops into Long Creek, um, I believe 12 years ago, I want to say. Um, so they, you know, they were bringing those exercises uh, of theater, the oppressed techniques into the facilities, and they began performing for their peers within the, the facility. And then there was a desire to take these um performances out into the public um, and so they were able to do so and actually bring the youth out of the facility and what they found was that that was doing an awful lot to change people's um, opinions experiences uh, with young people so there was um, a lot of emotional connection that was happening and um, eventually that became a, a very large component of Maine Inside Out because that's at that point they realized they had the power to start changing um, not only opinions, but actual approaches to incarceration. Um, I joined about five years um, prior to coming on as staff as a board member, at which time uh, Joseph had already had already kind of engaged as a uh, facilitator there. But I, I was on the board and we were still working primarily in Long Creek. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of the, um, eventually we stopped working in Long Creek and went into the communities. One thing that we've always wanted to do was create alternatives to um, the traditional approaches to um, harm, you know, harm impact, um, harm correction, whatever you want to call that. And so we started doing community groups and working with system impacted youth out in the communities which they lived. And I think that goes very deep into what the mission of Maine Inside Out is, is creating communities outside of incarceration, which will hopefully um, address, the, address the harms and address the wrongs um, in a very real direct way, rather than put, pushing youth into a system that really doesn't, doesn't care about them personally. Um, you know, so really Main Inside Out was based around developing relationships, developing alternative communities, and also performing around the state. And so now that we're doing community groups, it's much easier, we've been able to do it. But as you'd mentioned, um, you know, Maine Inside Out has performed at the State House, uh, DC, Michigan, all these different places to really change how people approach uh, youth incarceration. Um, at this point, we have a couple very exciting um, things on the horizon. Uh, you know, we've decided that not only do we want to exist as groups in the communities that we work with, but we're actually going into Lewiston to start our pilot site, our first physical location where we can do performances, where we can welcome the young people that we work with so that they have a space in the community. And also a large component of what we do is mutual aid. Um, so we help youth navigate 
various systems, whether, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, making sure that they have enough money as young parents or pay off their fines, um, you know, making sure that there's emotional support there, making sure that they're able to connect with other young people. And so what we're really hoping to do with this pilot site, which will hopefully launch towards the end of this year, um, is to provide a brick and mortar existence to the work that we've already been doing. Wow, that's amazing. Um, so Joseph, <laughs> You know, every time I hear about Long Creek, and I actually did some civil rights work in there years ago, I think about the, these incredible young people and how the system has failed them. Like, I, I personally believe that no young person belongs behind bars. There's nothing therapeutic about it. There's nothing that helps them. And once that pipeline gets started, it's really hard to break free. And one of the beauties of what I think looks like Inside Out is doing, not just for people to understand what goes on you know, with these kids, but also for these young people to understand their value and their worth and, you know, that kind of stuff. So tell us a little bit about your story and, um, you know, what you see with the young people inside Long Creek. Well, thank you for um, lifting that up about Long Creek. I, yes, um, what we, I think we have noticed and, and did notice that the um, school to prison pipeline is real and that 100% of the young people that find themselves incarcerated, uh, and, and, and that facility are sus first suspended from school. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then when we start looking at those folks um, who are being released, uh, man can hold you up to the time you're you know, 21, um, you know, 44% of them return to the system within the, within the first year of their release. And that number just increases um, you know, afterwards. And then we, you know, I'm, and part of my story is I'm um, a returning citizen. I spent 20 years inside the main department of corrections. Um, I'm also, um, I was, my first touch with the criminal justice system was, at a, was as a youth. Mm. Um, and so, um, you know, while I, you know, did you know, do my collegiate and, you know, educational background, you know, most of it while I was, while incarcerated, I began to understand that, um, um, that our system wasn't working. Um, that the men around me, uh, many of them who were from Maine, actually went through the, the youth center. Um, mm -hmm. And now they were serving time as an adult. And so, you know, Maine Inside Out for me, I think, was um, one of the things we recognized was that, yeah, there were plenty of people going inside and talking to young people and doing programming inside. But, you know, once they actually left the facility, there was a policy in place that said you couldn't even say hi to them unless you said hi. They said hi to you first. Um, so we kind of like started to address that because we understood that if we were, you know, I mean, creating relationships and these relationships were really going to be based in, you know, I mean, you know, reality and fact that um, they needed to follow you and that we needed to follow those those young folks. And so we just started um, open mics, um, really mm -hmm. peer to peer um, mentorship and, and, and advocating because you know, at different stages, depending upon where, how long you've been out, you've been through some things. And what we now see is that, um, you know, when somebody new's coming out, you know, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of trepidation. And that if you're around somebody that's been through it a little bit, you know, they can help you slow down a little bit and process mm -hmm. that. So um, it's been wonderful, um, you know, I mean, working with young people, using art as a way of processing you know, not only their trauma, but it's activism. And um, I think we've been you know, pretty successful at doing that. And as, as yeah. Bruce. Well, you know, one of the things as I have both have seen you live and looked at all your stuff, um, it seems that it's this, it's this two way thing. And I want to talk about both things. And one, I want to, what you just said, Joseph and Bruce, I want your opinion on this too. It seems that both on the way in to uh, interfacing with the correction system, and on the way out, trying to you know, come out and be released, there's just systems failures on both ends. You know, there's just feels like our systems have failed these young people. And I think we failed them on the way in, and it seems like we failed them on the way out as well. And, and I'm thrilled that you guys are gonna do this pilot site, but you know, talk a little bit about both on the way in and the way out. And I know Joseph, you told us, shared a story earlier with me, but you know, just uh, if you could just help people understand how you know, like, I think, I think there's a, a common cultural thing that these are the bad apples, right? These are the, you know, these, these there's something wrong with these kids. And just, the, you know, we know, I know, and you know that that's not true. These are, these are, these are young people whose system, our systems and our social structures have failed them. So can you talk a little bit about that? 
I can most definitely. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things, so in my story, I talk about how we noticed that 100% of the kids are, have been suspended. Yeah. So we get to no, notice um, that this young, this young person, this, this child is having a problem in school. And, you know, um, traditionally our, um, you know, uh, our method has been to remove them from school when they're <laughs> in middle school, right? Which for many of them is what they want, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. To need more school. But then what we see is that the counties with these highest rates of suspensions also, you know, seem to be also the counties with the highest rates of incarceration. And instead of, you know, I mean, our society and our, our community say, okay, let's look at this kid, figure out what he needs and give them what they need. Um, we use the criminal justice system as a measure to, uh, um, to try to hold some accountability. You're correct in that story I told you um, last time. Um, it was of a man who was in, you know, um, had been incarcerated um, in and out of foster homes at 11, um, emancipated at 14, um, and then, you know, held until, you know, he was 18 and released and was found himself in those statistics where he had returned to prison and then spent 20 years inside of that facility, um, you know, back and forth, back and forth. And what I heard in his story was an indictment on the system that, you know, there had been no real effort on the part of the system to make sure the person has stable housing, to socialize the person um, the way that normal, you know, young people will be socialized. And I will give you one, just one other thing. 100% of the kids uh, are indigent. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, um, in other words, they all need to have free attorneys, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and so, is, is I find it that there'd be no coincidence that the poorest of our kids, you know, I mean, you know, are finding, you know, are getting this while, um, you know, you know, other young people from different demographic are giving the thing they need to, to, to you know, to, to find themselves and be successful. And so, uh, um, yeah, our system is broken and um, we're not providing young people with the stable housing. Um, when they are um, found guilty, they um, they have to check the box, just like everybody else on the application to say they're a felon, which limits them to the type of employment they can receive. And, and we find that our young people have very, very hard times keeping um, jobs, um, traditional jobs anyway, and, you know, access to medical care and so forth. Um, so mental health is a, is a huge issue and substance use is a huge issue. But I think the last thing I would just say and you know the big mistake that we've made and why our system is broken is that we take all of these young kids that we define as bad and we put them in a big room together big building all together and what you do when you do that is um, you reinforce the belief and the perception of the kid not only that they're bad but that their perception of the world is, you know, is, is, is right. That, you know, the, and all of these other young people around them have these other similar experiences um, that kind of, that continues to perpetuate what you see and what you begin to understand versus, you know I mean? Um, putting them in different places, right? Cause you can't know what you don't know. And so I think that that has been a failure for a long time. Um, and that we're finally getting to a place I feel like Maine is starting to reckon with that. Yeah, it seems like the conversation is shifting a little bit. Bruce, are you feeling that the conversation is shifting? And then talk a little bit, if you would, about the supports or the lack of supports on the way out. You know, and that's this, you know, as you said, the school to prison pipeline. And then there seems to be a youth, youth correction system to adult incarceration pipeline as well, because we're missing those supports. So talk a little bit about it, if you would, Bruce. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think one thing is that we can't we can't divorce this from the adult system, especially when we're and and a lot of that dialogue is finally starting to change. Um, Joe Joseph and I met because he's the executive director of of Maine Prisoner Advocacy Coalition as well. Um, so both of us work on adult issues as well as uh, on youth issues, and you know, both of us have experienced the adult system. Um, but I think that understanding that the adult system has become the surrogate of real supports is how we see people transitioning from the youth youth incarceration to adult incarceration. Um, but there is a change in dialogue. I think that there's just a recognition that systems are systems themselves may be exactly what 
what need to be indicted as a whole. Like it maybe this approach of a system is is really a surrogate for actually doing something. Um, you know, so I think with Maine Inside Out, we recognize that we're not looking to grind people through systems because the idea of a system doesn't work in the first place. What people really need is is, is a community, a sense of belonging, as well as the supports that come with that. Um, so, you know, and that can that can take many forms, but um, but everything seems so standardized, um, you know. I think that that's one thing that Maine Inside Out wants to do. And all of a sudden we're starting to have that discussion on the legislative level too. Um, you know, when we're talking about reallocating funds, not every single um, conversation is just about, okay, let's add more money to other, to, to other systems. Like let's add more money to, you know, to, you know, DHHS, like let's actually, um, let's actually do some community building. Um, it's still a quiet voice. It's still something that's relatively small. So I think one thing that we're trying to do with Maine Inside Out is create the case that, you know, and be able to present that, no, what people really need isn't another system to be grinded through. Um, you know, yes, people need mental health supports, but mental health supports doesn't only have to be clinical. I'm looking at what's happening with the peer movement and right. how powerful right. that is. That's a, that's an amazing push. Um, you know, People need empowerment. People need a place to be. And that doesn't need to be standardized to one giant state or federal system. That, that can be individualized to each community. So one thing that we're pushing for is not just the funding um, being pushed into those bigger state structures. We say give it to the communities because each community is distinctly um, formed. It is distinctly structured. And the youth that grew up there were looking for something from that community. And so let's give the communities the ability to offer that because we're also looking at, you know, high levels of austerity that took a lot of that money out of those communities and kept, kept youth from being able to find their sense of belonging. You know, not every kid is going to thrive in your traditional um, sports program and your traditional rec department and, you know, those sorts of things. Many will. But many youth, especially when you add in those components of heavy trauma, um, are going to have a very hard time finding those. So, you know, one thing that we advocate very strongly for is an array of, of ways of being within the community that fits into the community at large. And I think that so important that sort of taking away that cookie cutter approach, whether it's inside or outside, right, that, that everyone and to me, it just feels like and one of the things I, I want to switch to talking about the young people a little bit. It feels like what everyone wants to feel is that they matter and that their life matters. And so it seems to me that one of the things that you all do by creating community and by you know, giving people a place to be is that they matter. And whether that's performing for somebody else or in the rehearsal, you know, just working together. So I would love it if you would share with me some of the inspirational stuff that you see, some of the transformation that you see. I heard one young man um, I was looking at last night who said, you know, I never, ever, ever shared my feelings, what was going on inside until I started working with Inside Out. And he said, and now it's the only place I do it. Um, you know, and that's like, that's a powerful statement um, and a, a testament to the work that you're doing. So tell us, tell us some stories, share some, what is the, the inspiration, what, I mean, this is hard work and you do it all day long on eight o'clock in the morning, you do it all the time. Tell us some of the things that inspire you, what you see with these young folks. Yeah, I mean, I can defer to Joseph, you know, with Joseph doing so much of the programming, um, he gets the one on one kind of, you know, interaction more, I get, I get a good amount of it. Um, but honestly, the, the, I, I guess one thing that I will say, um, before passing it is that the youth themselves are the experts as to what they need. And that's something that's really woven into the work that we're that we're trying to do. And once again, going back to that peer movement and going back to those sorts of um means of really elevating those voices, because if we don't do that, then we're going to continue to, you know, make these cookie cutters that are, are supposed to, uh, that everybody's supposed to fit in. And what, and it is, it is traumatic. We will use that language. It is incredibly traumatic to find that you don't fit into that cookie cutter. That was my story growing up as a, as a, as a Mexican American boy in Bath, Maine, you know, it was, and so, and so, you know, I found it, I found community and alternative methods that, 
led me down a certain path. And, um, and I'm hearing that time and time again from the youth when they're presenting. And the other thing that the artwork does is that it allows people to create in a way that is true to them because there's so many, I mean, even with the, we've switched to an open mic format. We don't do as much performative art. Um, so we've been doing these uh, virtual open mics and even though it's a virtual open mic, it's not all spoken word. You know, we, we get spoken word, we get interviews, we get songs, we get all sorts of different things. So even though we, we are a creator space, we try to leave it as open as possible so that youth can really infuse their own being into what they're doing because otherwise you just create the sense of, um if i can't do it this way i'm a failure right another box to fit in right exactly and yeah. so that's something that we that we fight for or that we fight against um very consciously yeah. and like i said joseph gets to work quite a bit with the on the with the one-on-one uh, -on -one workshops a little bit more so i'll let him you know i'll defer to him on the particular stories well, I can just tell you one of the, for me, the, the highlight and the best story that I can remember is um, we had a young person um, who was in Long Creek and had, was navigating the system and was released. And then once he was released, he did something, you know, you know, not a very smart move where he got intoxicated and then he went and vandalized his school, mm -hmm. just tore up some stuff. And he was facing some time. He was about to go back as an adult and uh, Main Inside Out intervened, got involved. Part of our system advocacy is, you know, we stay with folks and try to help them navigate. And we got the school to agree to a restorative process. Um, this young person went and they, they came back and they asked their peers if they would um, support them. Um, we performed a play at this school um, in the gym, gymnasium, the whole school was shut down. All the students were brought into the gymnasium. And this young, we did a play. And at the end of the play, this young man stood up and he went there and he gave, he apologized mm -hmm. to the entire class for his behavior. And it wasn't just that it was an apology. It was like, he knew this was coming all of this, but it wasn't scripted. I mean, this was one of the most, you know, heartfelt, apologies I've ever seen anybody displaying that and, and in fact I think it moved everybody because it felt like at least for those who were system impacted that he was apologizing for everybody that was on the stage mm, mm. and at the end of this you know the young people got to end Iraq and that was this small young freshman girl at the very end and she said you know I um I I'm just incredibly moved and I want to ask anybody that, you know, I forgive you, but I just want to ask if ever, anybody else forgives you, could we all please stand? And the entire audience stood. And at the biggest part of that was we had one um, school administrator who was really, really, I mean, ardent against, um, you know, this restored, this process. Right. Didn't want to do it. And there was, you know, it took a lot of convincing. And at the end of this, this person came up and I'm talking about the rivulets of tears flowing down their face. Um, it, it, it was one of the most powerful moments I ever, I ever experienced. And today that young man has a family, a couple of kids working, he's stable, um, he's doing super. Um, and, um, but it's because that, you know what I mean? You know, main inside out of, of a different way of looking at accountability that this was something that um, we were able to, you know, experience. And um, hopefully we just need to see more of stuff like that. That's amazing. So thank you so much. Um, it's crazy, but we are out of time. Um, but I just want to say to you, thank you so much for opening hearts and minds, but mostly hearts and souls to the value of every human being and how we can support them, how, you know, and, and I love this idea of that we, you know, we need, we don't need an, a different system. We need communication, we need connection. You know, I think we're all hired, hardwired for that connection and wanting to matter. And here you are working with young people who have basically been told they don't matter in a variety of ways from a variety of people and, and systems to say, no, 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 what you, you matter. And so from the bottom of my heart, I just wanna thank you so much for the work you're doing. I look forward to um, assisting in any way I can to make sure that 
our legislation and our public policy and our community conversations open up to the heart that the two of you have and that Inside Out gives us all. So thank you so much for thank your you. work. Thank, thank you much you. for your own beautiful hearts and for your beautiful paths and for using those to inspire other people. So your work is awesome and we will have you on again. Let's do a show sometime with some of these young people. That'd be so, amazing. That'd be awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Bruce. You are awesome. And thank you, Inside Out. Thank you. Thanks for watching and join us again. Well, I'm Colin Ambrosio and I'm part of Made Inside Out. I've been with them for about four years now. I'm just here to tell you what I've gone through. I decided to make a dumb decision. I ended up breaking in, vandalizing the school, and it was just a terrible mistake. I ended up going away for a couple months in the big boy jail, as you call it, which is Cumberland County Jail. I've been in and out of jails for, since I was like 15, and if I keep on going down this road, I'm gonna be keep on going in and out of prisons, maybe stuck in prison for life. I didn't see that as a good future for me. So this is me giving back to you guys for what I've taken from you. And I just wanted to tell you guys, I am sorry for what I have done. And I'm trying to be better. I'm doing better things now being able to give back to the community, being able to give back to you guys. So thank you for being able to come here today and able to give us a chance to perform for you. Do you see me? All who have struggled, salute. Start forgiving, because we all have flaws in the history of our living. If you see me, I'm existing. You can't say that I'm missing, so listen. All this can be annihilated. When they say go back, remember, we have all migrated. We are all one race in America. None is violated. This isn't your or my nation, so let's have a celebration. Eat and drink together. That's hydration. Every single one of you are very, very great people for trying to change your lives around. And I think everybody in this room forgives you for what happened. And I'm, I'm not mad. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. And it might be dumb, but I think everybody who forgives you should stand up really quick and just give you a big round of applause because. Thank you so much.